The history of ionization goes all the way back to Sir William Crookes in 1879. So this actually was developed before ASHRAE came about around 1894 or 1895. And uh, 1897, uh, that was when they actually looked at wanting to change the, the term to plasma tube because uh, Sir William Crookes, he called it the radiant matter tube as well as the Crookes tube. So obviously Crookes tube is not the best name to be out on the market trying to promote the technology. So they called it plasma tube and um, has been called plasma tube ever since. So in the photo here, you actually can see an example of what the plasma tube looked like or what we call corona discharge or dielectric barrier discharge. Those are the two terms in the market uh, for this technology. Some call it plasma, but it's more correct to say corona discharge or dielectric barrier discharge. And the reason why it's called uh, dielectric in the name is that the glass, in this case, acts as the dielectric. It could be uh, mica, it could be a ceramic, or it could be a composite type tube. But regardless, you have to have a dielectric and a filament on the inside of the dielectric and one on the outside, which is grounded. And when you have that, you have corona discharge. So when high voltage is applied to the inside of this tube, the voltage goes through the glass, assuming that there's enough power there to break down the dielectric of the glass so it can get to the screen on the outside, which is grounded. So that completes the electrical path to ground. And when that happens, you get this corona discharge, which turns the, the tube a little bit of a purple color. If you have it in a dark atmosphere, you can see it really well. And that creates ozone as a byproduct. The other problem with corona discharge tubes is the fact you have a part that wears out and has to be replaced. Needlepoint bipolar ionization is vastly different from corona tube technology. So if you refer to the ASHRAE journal in 2019, the June edition, you will find the differences between needlepoint bipolar ionization and the corona discharge, tu discharge tube technology. So with corona discharge tubes, the material of the dielectric can be glass, ceramic, mica, or composite, which when I say dielectric, it really means an insulator. Uh, to the electricity, which is a barrier to the path to ground, and the voltage and current, the power, I should say, overall must be higher than needlepoint bipolar ionization systems to make that dielectric break down and conduct electricity through it. So that completes the electrical circuit. The overall power level within the corona discharge technology must exceed 12.07 electron volts, which means you're going to ionize oxygen and you're going to make ozone as a byproduct. There's no way around it. If the systems are on and operating, they're generating ozone. While they may try to reduce the voltage to the tube to minimize how much ozone it generates, it's still generating ozone. That is, there's no way possible to use a corona discharge tube and not have ozone generated as a byproduct. Now, if you bring that over to the right-hand side and look at needlepoint bipolar ionization, there are no dielectrics that the ions have to get through in order to be injected into the airstream. So based on the polarity of the voltage being applied to the needle tip, that will determine the ions leaving the needle tip, whether it's positive or negative. And here you can see I have a, a shown a zoomed in photo of the FC24 product that we manufacture and it uses carbon fiber brushes. So each one of those individual brushes in that cluster acts as a needle tip. So when we apply the voltage to those needles, the ions emit directly into the airstream based on the polarity that's applied. So because we don't have a dielectric, we don't have to provide as high a voltage as the corona tube technology, so therefore we can stay below oxygen, and that means we don't generate ozone as a byproduct. And for those of you that aren't familiar with electron volt potentials, every gas in the atmosphere has an electron volt potential associated to it. And all that simply means is how much energy does it take to overcome the bonds holding that molecule together to the point that you ionize it. And on some gases, you're able to break down those bonds and split the molecules apart and convert them to something that's already prevalent or more desirable in the atmosphere. There's two types of needlepoint bipolar ionization. You have direct current and you also have alternating current. So direct current NPBI generally has two electrodes. One remains positive all the time. The other electrode remains negative all the time. And if you're using metal electrodes with direct current, 
metal will start corroding over time and the tips on the needles will become dull. We learned that with our first product called the GPS RN. We used stainless steel needles for the first six months of operation and we found that the needles would wear down even being stainless steel and so we switched all products to carbon fiber brushes to prevent the corrosion as a result of the direct current uh, in the system. Also when I say direct current that refers to the output only. The input may be alternating current, you know, 110, 24 volts, 208 to 240 AC, uh, or it could be direct current input as well. So that doesn't necessarily mean that the input has to be direct current, it just means that the output is DC or direct current. With the alternating current uh, ionization types of systems, each individual brush cluster is alternating between plus or minus based on the frequency that's being applied. So in the United States, that's going to be 60 hertz. In Europe, that's going to be 50 hertz output. So what sticks on one cycle will repel on the next within that type of system. And also with our alternating current devices, you see that uh, you have a little wave pattern in the mold of the device. Well, at the peak of the wave, that's where the carbon fiber brushes are located. So the way the air is flowing over these brushes, it's not directly impacting the brush with particles. So you don't see the brushes getting dirty because of particle impaction. And because it's AC, it's, it's uh, static neutral. So it's not drawing particles to it. Like with the DC technology, whatever's flowing through the air of the opposite polarity will stick to that particle. And that's why self-cleaning is so critical in direct current systems. Ions are naturally occurring. If you go high in atmosphere, or if you go to a waterfall or where the ocean hits the beach, you could measure, if you happen to have an air ion counter, around 5,000 ions per cubic centimeter in those locations. Inside of the city, the pollution from the buildings, as well as the traffic and the people, robs the air of its ions that are naturally occurring, and you generally have around 200 ions per cubic centimeter. And then inside of a building, the particle filters further reduce the ions in the air. Particle filters are designed to strain particles out of the air, but they also strain the positive negative charges back together, neutralizing ions on the filter's surface. So when you mount these devices, you always want to mount the ionization generators after the filters, not before. If you mount them before the filter, you will increase the filter efficiency a little bit, and you'll also help sanitize what the filter is capturing but you don't have the benefit of the particle reduction in the space and you don't have the benefit of keeping the cooling coils clean downstream when you mount the ion generators before the filter. So always mount the technology after the filters. Also when these ions are generated from these ionization devices you have about 60 seconds of life from the systems. So if you have the technology mounted in the air handler and your ductwork velocity is 1000 feet per minute, well you can determine how many feet you have in ductwork and approximately how many ions you'll be getting to the space based on the fact that you have a 60 second life. Knowing the velocity and the length of the duct, you can determine what that overall capacity could be into the space. When you walk away from the presentation, I want you to remember the acronym POPE. That stands for particles, odors, pathogens, and energy. Those are the items we will reduce by using this technology.